You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Greetings, fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on the Feast of the Epiphany. Father Alban Butler, in his Lives of the Saints, explains the meaning of today's feast day. Quote, the word epiphany means manifestation, and it has passed into general acceptance throughout the universal church from the fact that Jesus Christ manifested to the eyes of men his divine mission on this day first of all, when a miraculous star revealed his birth to the kings of the East, who in spite of the difficulties and dangers of a long and tedious journey through the deserts and mountains almost impassable, hastened at once to Bethlehem to adore him and to offer him mystical presence as to the King of Kings, to the God of heaven and earth, and to a man with all feeble and mortal. The second manifestation was when going out from the waters of the Jordan after having received baptism from the hands of St. John, the Holy Ghost descended on him in the visible form of a dove, and a voice from heaven was heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The third manifestation was that of his divine power, when at the marriage feast at Cana he changed the water into wine, at the sight whereof his disciples believed in him. The remembrance of these three great events concurring to the same end, the church has wished to celebrate in one and the same festival. End quote. So, today, we celebrate the whole idea of Christ's epiphany, or maybe it's more correct to say our epiphany. In common parlance, we might believe we've had an epiphany, you know, ding, when a light comes on, so to speak, and we suddenly understand a thing. It's an aha moment. The truth has manifested. These three moments in the history of the world were aha moments. When we were, when, when we are given the light to understand who Christ is. You might remember that the baptism of our Lord has a dedicated feast day coming up on the octave of the Epiphany, and the miracle at Cana is remembered by the Church on the second Sunday after the Epiphany. All three Epiphanies are included in today's feast, most definitely, but the common celebration on January 6th is the visitation of the Magi. So, what do we know about this event in history, commonly called the Feast of the Three Kings? You might be surprised to discover that what you take for granted as facts might not be true. Here's a little quiz to find out what we really know. First of all, we hear them called magi or wise men, and we hear them called kings. Who were Jesus' illustrious visitors, kings or wise men, and what is a magi? It bears mentioning that the only scriptural reference to the Magi's visit is found in the second chapter of Matthew, where St. Matthew refers to them as magos, which most biblical scholars agree were basically astrologers of the priestly class in the region of Persia, which is present-day Iran. They were known for their ability to interpret the stars and were in the high ranks of scholars in the East, often in the employ of the ruling classes, so they were most definitely wise men, but they were also, according to the tradition of the church, kings. According to church historian Cornelius Alapide, quote, the common opinion of the faithful is that these magi were kings, that is, petty kings or princes, and this belief is fully handed down by Saints Cyprian, Basil, Chrysostom, Jerome, Hilary, by Tertullian, Isidore, Bede, Edasius, who were all cited by Maldonatus and Baronius. End quote. So the provenance of their royalty is long held and continuous, though the exact locations of their kingdoms are not known. Many details from antiquity don't make it into the history books that have survived to our time. They are not, however, your average tourists or any old run-of-the-mill adventuresome scientists proving a theory. This entourage of what we might well call wise men was impressive enough that upon entering Jerusalem, they immediately received an audience with Herod, a man known for his ego and his brutality. How big was his entourage, you might ask? 
Some historians have posited that the Magi's company included servants, cooks, and an armed escort of up to 100 soldiers, an impressive retinue. And one of the reasons that Herod, as stated in Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, and all Jerusalem with him, was greatly alarmed when they showed up at the gates of the city. The size and pomp of the Magi's party, along with the possibility that they represented a kingdom not wise to offend, also explains why it seems that Herod didn't make any great effort to pursue the Magi when they left the kingdom instead of reporting back to Herod after the angel's warning. Second question, where were the Magi from? Hmm. Here is all we know from the Bible. Quote, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. That's from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I think most of us remember that the wise men were from the east, generally speaking, but do we know from where precisely they began their journey? Well, the answer is no, not precisely, though biblical scholars through the centuries have tracked their possible courses like bloodhounds. Many believe the Magi's home empire was Parthia, which before the time of Christ was called Persia and is now known as Iran. There was a known caste of pagan astrologer priests in Parthian society at the time called Zoroastrians, to which the Magi may well have belonged. But the journey of the Magi could also just as easily have originated in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, or modern-day Yemen in the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula. We just don't know. One way or another, though, it is fascinating to realize that in order to reach Jerusalem, the Magi and their company would almost had to have passed through the land of the Nabataeans, whose capital city was Petra, you know, of Indiana Jones fame, now in the country of Jordan. The Nabataeans were a force to be reckoned with at this time in the history of mankind. Their control over the trade routes that linked the Far East with the Eastern Mediterranean region gave them a monopoly over the spice trade in particular. It's highly likely that the Magi would have obtained their gifts for the newborn king from the Nabataeans before they entered Judea, seeing as Nabatea would have been the only place in the ancient Near East where they could have obtained all three of the gifts that they had chosen to give the Christ child. Which leads to question number three. What were the three gifts, and what did they symbolize? We read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's widely understood that the gifts of the Magi were more than precious commodities. Each one carried a deep significance that showed how much the Magi truly revered the Christ child and proved that they realized who he was by the symbolism of the gifts. Gold represents Christ's, what do you know? His kingship. Frankincense stands for his, yep, divinity. And myrrh, which is used in embalming, symbolizes, of course, the death for which Jesus, our Savior, was destined. Gold was the perfect gift to give baby Jesus for several reasons. Because the value of gold was and is so high, small quantities are easily portable. Gold holds its worth consistently and is easily used as tender. It's also universal. No matter where the Holy Family ended up, gold would be accepted in the markets. So, how much gold do you think the Magi gave the newborn king? $100 worth? $1,000? $10,000 worth? Or more? It's been estimated by biblical historians that a typical gift of gold to a newborn king would be a small chest of pure gold. If we assume a weight of 50 pounds based on today's Troy gold prices, the baby Jesus was gifted a value of $1,094,388 in precious metal by the Magi. Now, frankincense. Frankincense is an extraordinary commodity. 
The word itself comes from an old French word, franc incense, which literally means high quality incense or French incense. Made from the sap of a certain type of tree from the Bursera sea family, it takes eight to ten years before a tree begins to produce resin, and the manner of harvesting is painstaking and difficult. Though today you can find pure frankincense resin for $55 an ounce, or frankincense as an essential oil for between $10 and $25 an ounce, in the first century AD it was worth approximately $4,000 a pound, or $250 an ounce. At the time of Christ, frankincense was used as incense in Jewish rituals, but it has long been known to be of a particular value to health, even so far as being known as the holy grail of natural health products. It's an analgesic and an antiseptic. It's antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and an antidepressant. It's also a digestive aid, an expectorant, an immune system balancer, and is known to stimulate the regeneration of cells a good essential oil to have on hand. Myrrh is also a resin, but is presented most often in its liquid form as a fragrant oil. The tree it comes from, the Camophora myrrha, is also a member of the Bracera Sia family. Used in the embalming process in ancient times, the word itself means bitter in Aramaic, but it has over the ages been used in perfume making, as well as in natural medicines. It's used even today as an analgesic and as a remedy for indigestion, for coughs and colds, for arthritis, pain, and even cancer. Its value at the time of Christ due to its scarcity and difficulty of extraction equaled the cost of gold. But today, like frankincense, you can find it for about $14 an ounce as an essential oil. If you combine the value of the Magi's gifts, they are thought to have possibly totaled $4 million or more in today's money. So the next obvious question is, what happened to it all? One historian I ran across surmises that the treasure may have been placed under the stewardship of Joseph of Arimathea, who was the uncle of the Blessed Mother, the younger brother of St. Joachim. Did you know about that? St. Joseph of Arimathea was reputedly one of the wealthiest men in all of Judea at one time. It is conjectured that a prudent investment of the treasure of the Magi may have not only provided for the family after St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, died, but also provided an inheritance for our Lord when he reached adulthood. This is an interesting proposition, but I'm not sure I buy it. Knowing the Holy Family like we do, it's hard to imagine they didn't give all or most of the treasure away to the poor. It's a more common pious belief that this was indeed the case. Some believe St. Joseph may have prudently preserved enough to aid in their travels to Egypt and home again, but that was about it. And then there's this possibility to throw in the mix. The Orthodox Monastery of Great Lavra at Mount Athos in northeastern Greece claims to have in its possession the three gifts of the Magi, and the monks at Great Lavra detail a valid enough looking provenance to give one pause. I guess there is a chance that when the Blessed Mother kept all these things in her heart, she also kept the gifts of the Magi hidden away for posterity. Maybe. I don't know. I have a hard time imagining this one, too. But these are all only theories, after all. Though we may have an opinion, we don't really know. Tell us what you think in the comments below. Next question, number four. Has the Star of Bethlehem ever been scientifically explained? Not that we need scientific explanations, mind you. Much to the contrary. But the very fact that an astronomical challenge instigated our Magi's research and travels makes the question a natural one. What have astronomers from Jesus' day to our own concluded about the star? Or have they concluded anything? The answer is that there are no scientific answers to this one. Astronomers through the centuries have tried to explain the star in the East as everything from a supernova to a comet to a conjunction of planets. But using modern technology to map the constellations back to ancient times and employing good old-fashioned common sense, all theories tried so far have been pretty universally dismissed. The most honest among scientists call the Star of Bethlehem, only somewhat tongue-in-cheek, a UFO. 
It defines, after all, an unidentified flying object. According to St. Matthew's account, the star would have been very distinct and noticeable. It wouldn't have moved with the stars in a normal fashion. It was visible to the Magi during their travels and on the day that they found Jesus, but it was not visible to Herod and not visible to any other sources, and it was last seen only in the vicinity of Bethlehem in Judea and never seen again. Which leads to the conclusion that the star of the Magi followed to the crib of Jesus can be called either a UFO or a miracle. I'm going with miracle. Where did the star come from? Any child can tell you it came from God. Question number five. How many Magi followed the star to Bethlehem? Regardless of the claims of Christmas carols and long-held tradition in general, St. Matthew didn't tell us how many Magi arrived at the crash, but we know there were more than one, as he does refer to them in the plural as wise men. He wrote, quote, Having heard the king, they went their way, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, until it came and stood over where the child was. And seeing the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And entering into the house, they found the child with Mary his mother, and falling down, they adored him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And there you have it. No mention of the actual number of magi. So where did we get the idea that there were three? It's simple, really. There were three gifts. It became an easy conjecture that made songwriting and picture painting easier, to be sure. The Bible doesn't back it up, however, and through the early centuries especially, the guesses have varied. There are at least 85 paintings of the coming of the Magi in the catacombs at Rome, and the specifics vary from two or three or four Magi, and even up to eight, as found on an ancient vase painting from the early Christian era. The bottom line is that there might really have been three wise men, but we don't actually know for sure how many there were. Next question, number six. When in the chronology of the Nativity did the Magi arrive in Bethlehem? Was it on the night of Jesus' birth, as it is often depicted in art? The answer is, probably not. We know the shepherds, being alerted by the angels, were the first to visit the Holy Crush. And we know that it was at night, soon after the holy birth, since the message from the angels was, quote, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Since the Jewish day begins at sundown, around 6 p.m., we know that our Lord was born after sundown. It's unlikely that the Magi could have arrived in Jerusalem, obtained an audience with Herod, waited while Herod gathered all his chief priests and scribes for consultation, traveled the six miles to Bethlehem, and arrived on the night of our Lord's birth. Even if the Magi met with Herod the day after Jesus was born, the earliest they could have arrived at the stable would have been the next night. Many speculate, however, that this whole chain of events could have taken even longer, bringing the Magi to the stable a good deal later. For one, Herod ordered the murder of all male children under the age of two, Now, was this just to exaggerate the likelihood of catching the infant Savior in Herod's evil net, or was it because it was known that Jesus had been born months prior to the Magi's arrival? Another consideration is the fact that the pertinent verses from the original Hebrew use a word that can be construed as either a young child or a baby, instead of using the word that specifically means baby or infant, which may mean nothing, but it might mean something. We can also wonder at the timing and consideration of the Holy Family's visit to the temple 40 days after our Lord's birth for the presentation of the purification of the Blessed Mother. We know this journey back and forth from Jerusalem obviously preceded the flight into Egypt, and it doesn't stand to reason that Herod would have waited long to order the deaths of the Holy Innocents once he realized the Magi had slipped away and the King of Kings was in his kingdom. Chances are good that spies followed the Magi's caravan and reported back to Herod as soon as they realized where Jesus lay. The turnaround, then, had to have been very fast between the visit of the Magi and the flight into Egypt, and it had to have been after the purification and the presentation in the temple. 
which indicates that the earliest the Magi would likely have met the Holy Family would have been 43 or 44 days after the Nativity, accounting for the time it would have taken them to travel back to Bethlehem from Jerusalem. Add to this the proposition that if the Magi had already visited the Holy Family, St. Joseph and their Blessed Mother would not have had to offer the sacrifice of the poor, the turtle dove, at the presentation in the temple. They could have offered a lamb. Food for thought, anyway. We don't know for sure when the Magi brought gifts to the newborn king, but it almost definitely was not on the night of his birth. Question number seven. What do you think? Did the Magi ride camels? This is another we don't know for sure, but it's possible answer. If the Magi came from Arabia, considering their wealth, it's likely they'd have ridden horses, which were far more comfortable for a long ride, but they were almost definitely followed by camels used as pack animals. Incidentally, the Magi and camels are linked in prophecy. Isaiah 60 verses 4 through 6 reads, Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Epoph. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense, and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Question number eight. How did the relics of the three kings end up in Cologne, Germany? The shrine of the three kings, or at least three of the Magi, can be found in a beautiful sarcophagus in the Cathedral of Cologne. The shrine is shaped like a basilica with two sarcophagi standing next to each other, with the third sarcophagus resting on their roof ridges. It is approximately 43 inches wide, 60 inches high, and 87 inches long. The decoration of the structure is rich with filigree and enamel, and it is covered with over 1,000 jewels and beads. The basic structure is made of wood with gold and silver overlay. On the sides, there are depictions of the prophets, the apostles, and the evangelists. On one end, there are images of the adoration of the Magi, Mary enthroned with the infant Jesus, and the baptism of Christ, and above all, Christ enthroned at the Last Judgment. The other end shows scenes from the Passion. It is a truly magnificent memorial to the souls of these three Magi-turned-Christians who have gone down in history as martyrs of the faith, having met their demise somewhere in the Holy Land. I haven't been able to find the story of either their lives or their deaths, but I was able to work out, I'm pretty sure, how they ended up in Cologne, Germany. It's a story that, like their biographies, is wrapped in the mists of time, but which has enough historical detail to seem plausible. St. Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine the Great, who reigned in the 4th century, traveled throughout the Holy Lands, rescuing, as we know, many religious relics, including the cross of Christ himself. In her journeys, it's said that she also found the burial site of the Magi and moved their remains to the Church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, now known as Istanbul, Turkey. Fifty to seventy-five years later, the remains were moved to Milan, Italy. In 1164, Holy Roman Emperor Frederick the Red, in the midst of a time of great confusion in the Church due to a botched papal election, complete with two anti-popes, allowed the relics of the Magi to be moved from Milan to Cologne, a political decision that had to do with the loyalties of Germany at that time. By 1225, their remains had been placed in a unique gold sarcophagus constructed for them in the Cathedral of Cologne that you can still see today, and where you can venerate these holy men of the Epiphany, holy martyrs of the faith, who were, or were not, really named Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. Question number nine. What do you think? Are you ready for this? The first record we have of any names linked to the Magi is from Origen, one of the early Christian historians, incidentally a friend of St. Ambrose, circa 250 AD. These names were similar in sound to the ones we now know, but we don't know where Origen came up with the names. St. Matthew, of course, never even said there were three Magi, much less named them. 
There were other names that floated around in the early centuries from Larvendad, Gushnasapa, and Hormistus, so called by the early Syrians, and no, I'm not making this up, to Har, Karsudan, and Basanater, as they were named in Ethiopia. How is it then, you might ask, that the names Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar have survived to our day? This is what happened. It seems that sometime in the 6th century, the Emperor Justinian had commissioned for the Church of St. Apollinaire in the city of Ravenna, Italy, a mosaic of the wise men that you see here. And you see, with these figures, the artist placed three names as we now know them, and it stuck. Does this make you feel a little funny now, when the initials of the three kings are chalked above your door at the Epiphany Blessing? It was a little disconcerting when I first heard about this, but not to worry. Knowing the way our good God works, it may very well be true that even though we don't have biblical proof, there really were three magi, and their names really were Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. It may very well be that God allowed the truth to be manifest without our having proof in black and white. That is what faith is all about anyway, right? This type of tradition that surrounds the holy birth is incidental to the fact of the word made flesh, as long as it helps paint the picture of the truth of Christ's manifestation to the world and remains a wholesome aid to piety. It's all good. And there's this amazing little bonus. The letters that we see over our doors, C, M, and B, also stand for Christus Mansionum Benedicat, or God bless this house. The Prayer to the Three Kings by Evelyn Waugh Like me, you were late in coming. The shepherds were here long before even the cattle. They had joined the chorus of angels before you were started. For you, the primordial discipline of the heavens had to be relaxed and a new defiant light set to blaze amid the disconcerted stars. How laboriously you came, taking sights and calculating where the shepherds had run barefoot. How odd you looked on the road, attended by what outlandish liveries and laden with such preposterous gifts. You came at length to the first stage of your pilgrimage, and the great star stood still above you. What did you do? You stopped to call on King Herod. Deadly exchange of compliments in which there began that unended war of mobs and magistrates against the innocent. Yet you came, and were not turned away. You too found room before the manger. Your gifts were not needed, but they were accepted and put carefully by, for they were brought with love. In that new order of charity that had just come to life, there was room for you too. You were not lower in the eyes of the Holy Family than the ox or the ass. You are our special patrons, and patrons of all latecomers, of all who have a tedious journey to make to the truth, of all who are confused with knowledge and speculation, of all who through politeness make themselves partners in guilt, of all who stand in danger by reason of their talents. May we, too, before and at the end, find kneeling space in the straw. For his sake, who did not reject your curious gifts, pray always for all the learned, the oblique, and the delicate. Let them not be quite forgotten at the throne of God when the simple come into their kingdom. Amen. This prayer was written by Evelyn Waugh for his novel, Helena, written in 1950. Based on the legend of the Empress Helena, the mother of Emperor Constantine, of course, who searched for and found the relics of the true cross. The Empress makes this prayer to the three wise men before she finds the Holy Cross in the novel. Everyone here at Catholic Family Podcast prays that all of you and all of your houses are especially blessed on this holy feast of the Epiphany and throughout the new year. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Star of wonder, star of-